Hey everybody, today I'm going to do a brief walkthrough of the Off-Grid Trailers Expedition 2.0 uh, off-road camper trailer. <clears throat> this is something that uh, I had been researching for over a year before actually investing in one of these. And uh, from the time I ordered it, which was back in October of 2021, until I received it, which was yesterday, April 13, 2022, uh, you know, about a six month wait on these. And that has a lot to do with the um, pandemic and the supply chain shortages and all that. So. Just something to be aware of if you're interested in one of these types of, of units that uh, it might take a little while to get it from the manufacturer, but uh, it's definitely well worth the wait. Uh, before we get started though, I wanted to kind of emphasize something that really meant a lot to me when it came to investing in one of these trailers. Because uh, when you're looking around for a solution like this, there's many vendors uh, that, that supply something like this. You've got the Bushwhacker Boma, you've got the Boreas, you've got you know Turtleback. There's a number of different vendors out there that supply some sort of trailer like this. But really, when it came down to it, what really struck me as uh, the most impressive was uh, a couple of things. One, the off-grid website allowing you to kind of tailor and customize the trailer based on your desires and your needs, and then engaging uh, the vendor, the way that they would respond as far as. You know, it was a timely response. They made sure they got back with you. In some cases, it might have been a phone call, but they were there for me every step of the way. And when customer service is something that has really uh, suffered throughout the pandemic, it was very refreshing to find a company that still values their prospects and their customers. So uh, if you're like me and you find that extremely important, um, it, it's something that they do really, really well. And what that tells me is, if they're willing to support you so much during the purchasing process, then the support after the fact should be just as exceptional. And, and I expect nothing less from these guys. So kudos to Off Grid for, for being so responsive and, and being available for their customers. Uh, and one final note on that that I thought was interesting, and again, I apologize for the wind here, it's a little breezy, um, is that they have an ambassador program. So if you're interested in one of these, and, and they're not, you don't see these too often on the roads, at least here in the south of the US. So. Uh, when I was looking to invest in one of these things, I really wanted to get eyes on. I wanted to see what these things were all about, you know, from a size perspective, uh, just, you know, the quality, the craftsmanship, all that good stuff. And they have an ambassador program. So if there's an owner of one of these units in your area, they can set you up with scheduling a meeting with them to actually go and see one of these things with a real owner, somebody that actually has used these. It's not a dealer. It's just somebody that has bought one of these in the past and, and they can share their experiences with you. And to me, that was probably the most meaningful part of the experience because I got to see what these things are all about firsthand. And I got to talk to an owner about, you know, what matters, like what, what challenges have you had, what successes have you had, why did you buy what you bought and, and where have you used it? And, you know, just really getting an honest opinion from a firsthand owner on what these things are all about. So uh, kudos again to Off Grid for, for being so exceptional in every way. And uh, if you value that kind of experience, then uh, definitely take a look at these guys. Um, so let's take a look at this thing uh, from the outside in and I'll kind of explain why I bought what I bought, what I added to it, what I subtracted from it, and uh, kind of some of the challenges I've actually already had with the unit. Uh, mostly um, self-imposed challenges that I've already seen. So hopefully that'll be helpful. All right, let's get started. All right, first let's talk about the delivery itself and what's entailed in getting one of these units uh, shipped to you. So there's a couple ways you can buy one of these units. One is direct from the manufacturer, which is what I did. And then another is to buy it from a dealership. Uh, there is a dealer in Arizona that, that uh, deals in these types of trailers, but if you don't live in Arizona, it can be a little painful to get one of these things. So uh, the most common way is to order direct from the manufacturer, and that's what I did. Now, with that being said, when you finally get this thing delivered, there's some things to note that they don't tell you that I had to learn the hard way. And hopefully I can save you from that problem uh, when your time comes to get your trailer. So what will happen is you'll get a delivery driver that's got a big flatbed truck and they can't drive those down in uh, residential roads. So you'll end up meeting the driver in a parking lot somewhere. Your trailer will be fully wrapped in plastic. So they'll bring it off of their trailer. They'll unwrap it for you. Um, kind of make sure there's no damage to the trailer and all that good stuff and give you the paperwork. And depending on what you ordered in relation to the hitch, this is where some of the complication can come in. So if you did this as standard two, uh, two inch ball hitch, then there's no worries, right? As long as you have a ball hitch um, that you can hook it up to, you're good to go. Or if you're like me and you invest in the Max Coupler, which gives you that 360 degree articulation, uh, sounds great. Uh, there's some things you need to be aware of that you'll have to deal with when the driver shows up. And if you don't have either the tools or the, the understanding of where the thing is, you're, you're gonna be like me and you're gonna be scrambling to figure out how you're gonna hook this thing up to your vehicle. So the first thing that you'll notice, and I apologize if it gets shaky here, 
is um, this little bad boy. So this is my hitch that I bought from, I think it was Home Depot or something like that, and it doesn't have a ball on it, which is fine. Um, but you'll notice it's got this huge nut, and then it's got this, what looks like an Allen wrench type deal. Let's see if I can get a little closer to that. Uh, and if you don't have the tow hitch tool to be able to wrench this, uh, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> so what I recommend is uh, a couple of things. Either get the wrench tool that you need from something like an AutoZone or an O'Reilly's or something like that, so that you'll have that available. And then now the question is, what do I do about this end of it? Well, what they don't tell you in the uh, documentation or in the videos that you have on this is that there's actually a key that you get with your uh, user manuals and stuff that actually installs in this and you just need a crescent wrench so you hold this in with a crescent wrench and then you screw this down so if you have one of those moments where you start to freak out a little bit be aware this is what that looks like this is what's going to be in your user manual bag so you're going to want to open up the trailer when you get it from the delivery guy Find your little black, and I'll show you what it looks like here in a minute, and get this out. Because that's what you're going to need to be able to install that max coupler hitch onto your um, your, your actual non-bald hitch. Okay? So, just be aware of that. The second thing is, notice how I have this thing installed? I've got it on the outward side. That's important. If you install it the other way around, your vehicle's going to droop too low and your chains are going to drag. So, make sure you don't uh, mess that up by installing it the wrong way around. You're gonna to wanna to install it this way. Um, so I, again, the way I did it now, again, if you don't have these tools or it's a one-time thing for you, you can go to AutoZone or you can go to O'Reilly's. They have the tools there and they will help you put this on. Just make sure you put it on the correct way. So you don't even have to buy the tools if you don't want to. You can go to a place like that and they'll, they'll easily help you out. So uh, that's one thing to be aware of. Um, and it's just something that is important because obviously if you don't have the right tools, you can't get, hook this thing up to your vehicle second thing to be aware of is the seven pin hitch or a seven pin connector okay um, they do tell you this in the videos but it's really difficult to know if your vehicle is going to have a problem with this or not this thing is relatively small if your seven pin connector on your vehicle is right behind the tow hitch that's fine it'll plug in just fine but if you're running a forerunner a land cruiser something where you actually have um, these uh, those plugs either on the far right or the far left side of the vehicle then that won't reach and you're going to need a little three foot extender so that's something to be aware of that uh i didn't have the extender because i didn't know if i needed it or not and uh i have a fifth gen forerunner so if you have a fifth gen or a sixth gen which whenever they come out you're going to need an extension and typically a three foot extension will be fine uh, also on the front uh, i did opt for the spare tire uh, i did it for a couple reasons one because obviously it kind of looks cool you have an extra tire uh, but also it kind of serves as a rock guard because that's the one thing if you don't get the spare tire this is exposed to all the junk that's going to be kicked back from your vehicle so having that tire gives you a little sense of protection um, but it's also worth it because now you have a spare tire which is kind of neat um, the jack itself is uh, an add-on so you get a standard jack i highly recommend this uh, i was on the fence when i first saw it but after talking to the owners of theirs i realized it's pretty important to have something like that so it's well worth the investment to go ahead and upgrade the jack it makes it much easier to move it around a lot more flexibility and a, a lot more robust all right, so let's talk about um, some of the things that I invested in from the things that I subtracted when I did my order. Okay, so when it came to ordering my unit, one of the things that I made sure I did not include was a rooftop tent. Uh, and the reason for that is, is it adds additional weight, it adds additional height, and, um, you know, I'm not really going to sleep with two people on the roof. Um, for me, all the people I go camping with have their own gear, so they're going to sleep in their own tents, and it just didn't feel like it was necessary for me to get a tent. If I decide to change my mind later, it's not a big deal to put one on it, so that's why I didn't go with that option. Uh, I did go with the 270 degree awning though. I think that is critical. It kind of wraps all the way around to the back, gives you some additional shade, uh, and makes it a much more uh, enjoyable experience when you're out in the sun. Um, I did opt for the additional lighting package, so you can never have too many lights on a trailer. And for me, every one of the cabinets has now has a light in it. Uh, and I've got, you know, it's much better when you're working at night without having to have a headlamp on or a flashlight or something that, that can help you light your way. So those are some two critical things that uh, one that I've subtracted and one that I added just to have that, um, you know, additional capability around the lighting. Uh, the other thing that I'll show you guys a little bit later is you can upgrade the max fan on the inside with one that includes a remote. Um, you know, to me, 
the controls were right there. You can just twist a dial to move the, the cover over and then just hit the buttons. It wasn't worth the additional investment to get the uh, upgraded Max fan that just has a remote. Same fan, just has the additional electronics. I also went with a standard um, 1000 watt inverter. I didn't go with the upgraded 2000 watt um, simply because, honestly, if I'm going to plug stuff into the battery, it requires 110. I'm probably going to bring a generator. Um, and if I need to run stuff off that inverter, it'll be very, very limited. So there wasn't really a reason for me to upgrade the inverter. I just didn't see me using it that often. Uh, and you may feel the same way. Now, obviously, with the inverter I have, I don't want to plug sensitive electronics into it. <clears throat> so I won't be plugging in a laptop or anything like that. But for what I plan to use it for, if any or ever, uh, it's fine. Uh, the other thing that I opted for, which I was actually kind of late on the fence with, is the... Um, privacy shades, which I'll show you when I go on the inside, and that was because uh, that was actually a late uh, order change that I made, meaning that I originally ordered the trailer without it, and then when they gave me the final option to augment, I went ahead and got them, and I did that specifically because when I talked to some people about how they use their trailer, they sometimes will park uh, at a park, and there are other people around, and at night, with the lights on, you can see directly in the cabin, so it made sense to go ahead and get the privacy shades just for that. Uh, although it does eliminate some of your situational awareness because it is extremely quiet in the trailer. You're not going to hear anything outside of it. So um, I think it's worth the investment just due to the nature of what it does for you. But you know, again, your mileage may vary. Okay, now that we got everything opened up, let's talk about uh, what's inside the trailer as far as what features you get. Starting with the electrical. As I mentioned earlier, um, I, I didn't opt for the upgraded inverter. I didn't feel like there was a need to plug anything in that was going to require that kind of wattage, so I just stuck with this, the standard 1000 watt inverter. Uh, you'll notice that this comes with some 12 volt AGM batteries, um, dual batteries, which is really nice. And the cool thing about this is that I asked about this before I purchased, is the controller that this comes with is actually lithium capable. So if you decide later on you want to replace the AGM batteries with something like a Battleborn battery or a couple batteries, uh, you don't have to change out the controller. You swap out the batteries and you're good to go so just something to consider from an upgrade perspective if that's something that you uh, are interested in that is easily done with this trailer which is really nice got some additional storage above the batteries for other accessories that you want to put in which is nice um, let's go ahead and move around to the side here and we'll talk a little bit more about everything else so what we have here is the uh, on-demand hot water heater and the propex furnace uh, as well as my light switches for the lighting around the, tra the trailer itself the Propex Furnace is actually an option. It's not um, something that you get as standard. Um, but when I was looking at these trailers, I was kind of on the fence about getting a furnace because I do live in the south. We don't really get that much in the way of cold winters. And I was kind of on the fence. It's a pretty sizable investment. I think it's about 1500 bucks, And uh, just wasn't sure if it was going to be worth it or not. But after talking to a couple of owners of these, even though they live here in the south, they say you're going to want that because it does help kind of keep things warm in the winter. Uh, and it's better to have it not need it than need it and not have it, which is you know kind of a, a strategy for uh, buying pretty much anything. So I went ahead and opted in for it just in case. Uh, it'll make a much more comfortable situation if I decide to leave the state and go up somewhere when it's really cold. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, when it comes to the propane, you it, it comes with an 11-pound uh, propane tank. Uh, this is empty, so you'll have to fill it up when you first get it. They do have a 20-pound propane tank add-on that you can put in. Um, to give you 20 pounds if you need it, but from the people I've spoken to, when all you're doing is uh, doing hot water uh, and maybe the furnace and maybe the stove, you don't really need much more than 11 pounds for most trips. And if you do, bring another can and just swap them out in the field. So that made a lot of sense and that's why I went ahead and stuck with the 11 pound. It's also a little more streamlined. You're technically supposed to take this down when you transport it. Uh, some people do, some people don't. It depends on who you are. When it comes to the water fill point, something to note about this trailer it does take 31 gallons of water which is actually really really nice uh, some of these trailers that you see out there from other manufacturers might have a nine gallon tank maybe a 14 gallon tank uh, in my opinion you can never have too much water it's it if you've ever done any kind of RVing you know how fast especially if you're boondocking the RV you'll know how fast you go through water from both showers and just cleaning up you know washing stuff off you'll go through that 30 gallons in a hurry um, so the more water you can get, the better off you're going to be, the longer you'll be able to stay out, which is really nice. Uh, the only challenge I see with this is that you end up in a situation where you have to deal with um, refilling it in the field. So this is, as you can tell, because it's a standard RV port, you typically will put it, you know, a hose to it or something like that to fill it up. 
if you have a five gallon water can, it makes it much more difficult to fill it up without a, you know, a funnel or some other mechanism to put it in there. So if you, you know, from a field perspective, if you've got a lot of people using your water, what I typically do is if people are gonna go camping with me and they wanna use the shower, bring five gallons of water. And that way you'll at least be able to replace what you use. Um, but unfortunately it makes it pretty difficult to refill as is. Some of the other trailer designers have put that uh, water port closer to the fender and they've made it a big mouth port. So it's very easy to refill it with water cans. But uh, this is something that OGT has not done yet. Uh, they do have the feedback. I provided this before I bought it and they said it's something that they might be looking into in the future. So let's take a look at the back and then uh, the kitchen area. Okay, so as we move around to the side and the back, just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, you'll notice that there's a bracket there that's hanging out. That's where the privacy shower goes, and unfortunately those are on back order at the moment. So once I get mine in, I'll be able to actually install that. And it just swings out and actually provides a shower type opportunity. So you, you have a place for uh, you know, either the shower or maybe a porta potty or something like that. So that you got a little bit of privacy for uh, you know being outdoors and all that good stuff. Um, well, let's go ahead and move around to the back as well so that way I can show you guys what the storage looks like. So you'll notice a uh, pretty decent storage setup for a trailer like this. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that normally on trailers like this you find the galley back here. Uh, what what Offgrid did is they put the kitchen on the, the side of the trailer instead and then allowed more storage in the rear. And these shelves are modular so you can move them up and down depending on your, your needs. Um, I do see people using wolf packs um, to be able to, to kind of have things, you know, in a little bit of a uh, managed storage type deal. But if you're like me and you're familiar with tent camping and do that quite frequently, then you'll probably agree that the most annoying part is having to load up the vehicle with all your kitchen stuff, unloading it at the campsite, reloading it when you're done, and then re unloading it when you get home. It's so much easier to have all of that stuff stored in a trailer. So all you have to do is just get your food, your water, make sure your batteries are topped off, and you're on the road. Um, so you no longer have to spend hours prepping a vehicle to get out to the campsite. So having uh, onboard storage like this, uh, just like the water, you can never have enough storage. So uh, the more I looked into this, the more it grew on me as an option. Underneath here uh, is your water, pour, uh, your water pump, I do believe. So you can take that off if you need to service the water pump. Um, and that's where it's located on the trailer. Um, so let's go ahead and move around to the side and we'll talk about the kitchen next. So the kitchen itself slides down from the side. It just kind of folds down uh, in a side compartment. And with it, you get a double burner stove. That's a Dometic stove. And you get a hot and cold water faucet. Uh, there is no gray tank on this uh, trailer, which is actually okay. It's less crap you have to haul around. Um, so when you use the sink, all that water comes out of the bottom of it. What a lot of people do is they, there's a, a pipe that they ship with the unit that you can screw onto the underside of it and then you can dump that water into a bucket uh, or uh, I've seen other people put a hose on it and just snake the hose out away from the campsite that way they're not having to deal with water um, muddying up their area. So a couple of different ways you can handle that but um, this makes it very convenient um, to be able to cook without having to worry about you know, taking up a lot of unusable space. Uh, the only downside to this is, in my opinion, is that there's not a lot of preparation space. Uh, you can fold down the lid on the stove. You can even put this, uh, a cover over the sink and make that your prep area. But when you do that, you kind of eliminate being able to use either one of those. Uh, a lot of people will use the fenders as a preparation point and use those stairs uh, to get up on the roof as like a spice rack holder. So I guess that's from a field expediency perspective is, is okay. Uh, but it's one area that... Uh, a simple change, in my opinion, is to take this stove and add an additional, um, you know, like a slide out that gives you some cooking space. And even if it has to have a leg to stabilize it, that's fine. Um, at least you'll have additional prep space. Again, that's feedback I have provided to the manufacturer. It's something that they might be looking into. You'll notice that the door for that actually latches onto the stove itself to kind of hold it up. I think that's a nice touch. That way you don't have additional legs hanging off of the thing. Um, so. That's, uh, that's one way, a good use of the door. Um, let's talk about the fridge here. So standard, you'll get a Dometic fridge, which is, is pretty nice. Uh, I went ahead and, and opted for the upgraded Truma fridge. And the very uh, specific reason why I did that is because I wanted the dual uh, zone fridge. So I do have a freezer and a fridge option with this. Uh, I found that, you know, hauling out ice is pretty painful if you're doing it in a cooler. You know, it only lasts a couple of days before it melts, especially in August in the south. So having a, a freezer that can keep things cold makes things a lot more flexible. Uh, it is a deeper fridge, so it's a, lot, a little bit bigger capacity than the standard that you get. The top is removable. You can actually flip the, the lid around if you need to for flexibility, which is kind of neat. Uh, and I do believe this, this Truma is connected, so you can actually use um, 
an application to kind of control the temperatures without having to go and actually touch the, the unit, which is kind of nice. Uh, you might think it's glamping, but there's nothing better than being able to serve ice cream out at a campsite in the middle of nowhere. I know that sounds kind of funny, but a little bit of luxury when you're out in the field is, uh, is definitely worth the investment. So uh, I, I recommend upgrading the fridge. Like I said, if nothing else, you get the ability to freeze foods as well as um, have a, a deeper capacity option, which is uh, pretty nice. So let's go ahead and take a look on the inside next, and I can show you some of the things that actually uh, really tipped me over the edge when it came to investing in one of these trailers. Okay, before we go in, I wanted to point out um, one of the things about this trailer that you may or may not have noticed when I was showing the kitchen off, and it's those two little vent ports that you see up there on, at the top. Um, that is actually a uh, what they call an AC prep modification to the trailer, and it is an option. It's something that you can get, and if you have one of the AC units, I highly recommend you do it because it allows you to repurpose that. Um, so those are the ventilation port ports for the AC unit. Now, that being said, uh, the type of AC unit that I think this is, again, one of the tipping points for why I invested in this trailer. When I was looking around, when it came to AC, there's a couple of different options that you'll typically see. You'll have one of the rooftop mounted AC units, which requires shore power to run. Or if you're lucky, you might have a, an outboard AC unit that's portable, like a climate right, you know, box type AC unit. But in either case, they're pretty cumbersome and it has specific power requirements. So what Off Grid did, is they actually made it an option that if you own a zero breeze portable AC, if you don't know what that is, I highly encourage you to look that up. It's a lithium powered, lithium battery powered portable AC unit. It's designed really to kind of cool down tents in the summer and that's why I bought it, it was because I was tired of sweating so much in August. And so it, it'll cool down a space uh, and it's battery powered so you don't have to worry about plugging it in uh, and it makes it uh, you know pretty useful. Right? So what Off-Grid did is they actually have their AC prepping to support a Zero Breeze AC. Now they don't supply the Zero Breeze, you have to buy that separately, but if you have one, it makes it so much easier. Because then you just put the AC unit in with the battery, you run it, you cool down your trailer. So no fuss, no muss, and it's a, you know, a versatile unit. You can take it out and do whatever you want with it. So that's what those ports are for, and I'll show you how they've modified that on the inside of the trailer here in a second. Okay, from the inside, just a couple of excuse me, items to, to mention. You do get some goodies when you when you buy a trailer like this. In the gray bag there, uh, it includes things like a shovel and a hatchet and some you know nice little little toys that, that come with the trailer. So that's a nice touch. And the black bag is all of your manuals. That's where you'll find that uh, that key for the, the trailer hitch. So uh, if you're wondering where that's at, it's in that black bag. So when you open up your trailer for the first time, you'll see that in there. And you'll just want to dig in there and, and pull that out. So just be wary of that. Uh, underneath that is the Canada Proof 180 volt, um, I'm sorry, 180 watt solar panel. It's a foldable solar panel that you can lay out. Now, here's the cool thing, right? When you look at these trailers, uh, not specifically off-grid, but any other vendor, a lot of times you'll see that they have an integrated solar panel on the roof or on the side or somewhere where it's built onto the trailer. In theory, that sounds cool. That sounds like, hey, that's one less thing I have to worry about. The problem is you've got to park your trailer in the sun. And solar panels are dependent on the angle and the you know where you face the sun, and so they gain less efficiency, or actually they lose efficiency when you're not at the right angle. So you're kind of limited when you have solar panels directly on the, the the trailer. So having a solar system like this that allows you to move the solar panel away from the trailer, allows you to park your trailer in the shade, keeps it nice and cool while still having the power to trickle charge your batteries when you're in the field. I think that's smart. That is a better way to go. So. That's another thing. This, this solar panel is uh, an option. It's not standard, but I highly recommend you do it. Now, you don't have to get theirs. Uh, you can get something else, but, you know, it's Canada proof. It's rugged. I think it weighs like 30 pounds, and it's really stout and really well built. And the trailer is already set up for solar power, so you just plug the, the cable into the ZAMP control, uh, the port, and you're good to go. So, just something to be aware of as an option, and I highly recommend that. We already talked a little bit about the privacy shades. That's these. They just snap on, um, and then you roll it up if, when you don't want to use it. So kind of blocks out the light and, and gives you some privacy inside of the trailer. So when we talk about what's on the inside, uh, let me go to the other side and I'll kind of show you from that point. Okay, so when it comes to the mattress that this has, uh, one, interestingly enough, you get two choices and one is an option and one is standard. What I have here is the standard mattress. Um, so it's, you know, a, a good padded mattress, uh, good support, all that good stuff. They have a second type of mattress that folds up into a couch. And that mattress is a little thicker than this one, but the, in my opinion, the disadvantage is you're sleeping in seams, right? So you're sleeping in all the fold points. If you ever slept on a, font, uh, a futon, you're probably not going to want that. Now, 
that's just my opinion. I'd, I've never slept in one that has those. The owners of the ones that I saw actually had the foldable couch model, and they said it was fine for them. Uh, I just went with the standard because I don't ever plan to turn this into a couch, to be honest with you. But that is an option. It's something to be aware of if you want that. So at the top, we have the, like I said, the Max Fan. It's the standard model, meaning that it doesn't have the remote. Uh, again, all the controls are on the fan itself. In my opinion, that's good enough for what I need it for. Uh, I've heard that if you want to cool the trailer down fast, you just roll the windows down and actually turn the fan on reverse. It'll suck all the hot air out and bring colder air in, so it actually cools the trailer down pretty considerably, um, which is always a good thing. The other thing you'll notice is the spine that goes up the, the length of the wall. And uh, at first you might think, well, that looks kind of annoying. But the reality is all the wiring to the trailer is behind that spine. So the wiring is not embedded in the wall. It's actually accessible in case you need to repair something or make modifications. They've really given you some options there for, um, for, for making changes to your own trailer, which is really nice. Um, when it comes to what's inside, let's see if I can get here stabilized. You'll notice there's a lot of storage place uh, facilities. So each one of these bottom ones actually is for storage. You can actually pull down the, the, the cover to it. It attaches to that little part in the wall there and actually becomes a tray. So you can put your laptop or something like that or store your phone up there for charging purposes uh, if you want to... Um, to do that overnight, uh, whatever the case may be. The other thing I want to point out is in the back corner here, this is the AC prep. And you're gonna have to forgive me for stabilization here, but let me take this off of the rig and hopefully not make anybody sick <laughs> by looking at this. So inside the trailer here is, or I'm sorry, inside this little cubby hole is the space for the Zero Breeze. To me, that's a really nice option, right, to be able to install your Zero Breeze directly on it. Now, I haven't put mine out here yet. I might do another video where I show you how to do that, um, but it's already set up for a Zero Breeze, which is really nice. You also have your controllers for uh, things like your furnace. You can turn on your inverter from here. Uh, you can turn on the lighting inside the trailer from here. You've got a 110 outlet, which I, I think that one is shore power. I don't believe that runs off the inverter, but I'll have to look. And then you actually have your... Uh, USB ports which do run off the battery so if you're charging your phone or whatever you can do that very easily and then we have the ports for the uh, the furnace to heat up the place so I want to show you just how deep these storage uh, containers are I mean that is amazing right you can keep all of your uh, linens and everything that you need in here uh, which makes it very nice from a, uh, a storage perspective so you don't have to keep hauling out this stuff the other thing that's interesting is your water gauge. So if you need to know how much water you have left, that stripe there tells you how full your, uh, your water tank is. That's a nice touch, right? Now you know you're not going to run out of water because you can see it. Um, so that's it from the inside. Let me get this thing hooked back up to the stabilized rig and I can kind of show you uh, or just do some final thoughts on, on the trailer itself. Okay, a couple last things and then we'll get to final thoughts on the trailer. Uh, one is, one of the things that surprised me about this trailer was the uh, thickness of the walls. Uh, really surprised me how thick these things are. And they do have a high R value as far as insulation. Again, this is a Canadian-based trailer, so or Canadian-built trailer, so it's designed for, uh, you know, cold weather temperatures or really uh, have good insulation requirements. The other thing that's interesting are these seals. These are auto seals, so it keeps all the dust out. You really feel a good compression when you shut the door, so that way you don't have to worry about dust getting all up in your trailer. So those are two additional features that I like to point out because they, they really are surprising for uh, people that are not used to seeing such craftsmanship in a trailer like this. This thing is really built like a tank. It's an all metal design, so there's no wood, no need to worry about mildew, um, and it's gonna probably outlive me. So really happy uh, with my choice. All right, so in summary, just to talk about, you know, just wrap everything up. Um, to me, this was a worthwhile investment and I cannot wait to get it out on the road and get it you know on the trails out at uh, different rivers and stuff that i've been looking into to really enjoy the camping experience uh, it elevates it from being in a tent to uh, not being in an rv so to me it's just enough roughing where you've got outboard kitchen outboard shower but you still have something that you can sleep in where you're outside of the elements so just some thoughts uh, if you're interested in something like this or you have any additional questions i'll try to help you answer those uh, again i just got this thing so i'm just now learning it myself but uh Highly encourage you guys to take a look at off-grid and, and see what their offerings are. This is just one of the three types of trailers they offer. They also have a Pando and a Switchback, which uh, one is bigger and one is just a trailer that's got some pretty cool amenities. So depending on your needs, uh, they can probably fit it and, uh, and help you out there. So hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully it was informative and uh, look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks.